Good evening, Seawolf family. Welcome back to Wednesdays in the Word. I'm Pastor D here at the Church with Our Stretched Arms. We're just so grateful and thankful that you, you've chosen just to chime in tonight to be able to hear what God is speaking into the life, not only of you, but into the life of our church and into the body of Christ. If you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, or maybe you've missed a week, I challenge you. I challenge you to go back and watch all of the Bible studies that we have done over the last few weeks uh, in our Wednesdays in the Word. But we've been really diving into evangelism uh, as we've been talking about keeping the chains moving. It's been a very challenging, very challenging word. Uh, if you haven't been challenged, then I, I pray to God that you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you by his word. Uh, so we thank God for you today. Uh, for all of you who are here, uh, if you do not have the notes, once again, as always, we ask that you uh, type your, your email in the chat um, so we can be able to make sure that we get you the notes. These are some very important things that we want to make sure that we share with you today. And uh, as always, I, I'll give you the notes as I write them. So it's not anything that's pretty or I want you to have exactly what, what God has given to me. So uh I want to make sure that you have that. So type your email in the chat. Uh, let us go down and pray because I really want to get into this word today. Man, I am so excited. If you've been blessed. All right, if you've been blessed by this word. Uh, say amen in the chat. Say amen in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, this is this is truly moving us. So we ought to start seeing some growth. Uh, we ought to see, start, start having conversations with people now that are pushing us to becoming greater. Uh, disciples of Christ. Amen. Let us bow as we pray this evening. Eternal God, we come to you. We say thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for always meeting us here, God, and allowing us to be able to rightly divide the word of truth as it is given to uh, the vessel of God. Thank you, God, for choosing me to be able to share your word with your people. Now, God, we ask that we block out distractions. We remove ourselves, God, from your word so that we might not be hindrances of being selfish to understanding you, your truth. Teach us, O oh God, today. Help us, O oh God, to move. That we're not meant to be complacent. We're not meant to be stagnated. But your word tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey your command. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're ready to go. Now, this is gonna be part two of last week as we uh, talked about interpersonal evangelism. Interpersonal evangelism, this will be part two. Uh, we're gonna go back to the same scripture as we talk about this uh, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, which is a very, very intriguing scripture. Um, again, if you missed last week, I'm not going to go back into that, but I will be uh, reemphasizing some of the things that we spoke about and talked about on last week. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to John 4. John 4. And for the sake of uh, understanding, I want to read the entire story to you. The more you read scripture over and over and over again, God continues to reveal things to you. So I challenge you uh, as you study scripture, read it over and over and over again, and uh, God will give you a better understanding of what he's saying. Amen. Verse, verse one says, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. And we talked about that. He had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground of Jacob, had, which was given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it, and, and who that asks for, who it, who it is that asks for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did all of his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never be thirsty. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is... You have had five husbands and the man you are now, the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today. I know those are a lot of verses, but that's it's very significant that we read um, this in its entirety so that we gain a better understanding. Again, I want to reiterate uh, what interpersonal evangelism is. Interpersonal evangelism is the ability to communicate the gospel through a relational experience and encounter between persons. Make sure we get that. It's the ability to communicate the gospel through a relational experience and encounter between persons. All right. Uh, let us be reminded <laughs> that, that the scriptures stated that Jesus had to go through Samaria, okay? Had to go through Samaria, which means it was necessary. It was necessary that he, he went through Samaria. And, and as we look at this scripture, we gain, a, we gain more insight into who this Samaritan woman was. Remember last week, if, if you remember this, we talked about this woman and uh, a lot of times as this woman has been talked about and people have preached and taught that this woman was uh, a bit of an adulterer or more like a prostitute or someone who had this filthy life of sin. But as we look at this woman, this, this woman is more intriguing than that. And, and if Jesus, if it was a necessity for Jesus to go to Samaria and meet this woman, I would definitely plead with us that there is more significance in Jesus' encounter with this Samaritan woman than just to reveal her sin or to, to rid her of her sin. This woman was more than that. As a matter of fact, I would like to bring attention to the fact that this woman had been married five times. And a lot of times I've heard people speak of this woman and we see her as a woman of sin. 
When in actuality, there's nothing sinful about being married five times. She was actually engaged in uh, a marital, uh, holy matrimony, so to speak. And at that time, uh, a woman did not have the uh, freedom to just divorce her husband. It would have to have been the husband who divorced her, which would then allow her to be remarried. Everybody following me? And I would like to bring this point up. Think about it. There had to be something of value of this woman. For even after being divorced or maybe her husband and maybe had died, maybe she was widowed, that there was still something of value of her for her to continue to be married multiple times. Her sin came from her being in a relationship now with a man who was not her husband. We don't know the, the gist and the, the full backstory of this woman, but she's more than just this adultering woman that, that we have grown to know. I would plead with you that this woman is intelligent. This woman is smart. And Jesus takes this opportunity to talk to a Samaritan who was despised of Jews and who Jews looked down upon. Not only does he take this time to talk to a Samaritan, but he takes this time to talk to a woman. I asked you a question tonight. Um, uh, and then this is a Bible question. All my Bible scholars, uh, I, I want y'all to answer this. Uh, what was the longest conversation that Jesus had with any person in the Bible? Think about it. If you answered John chapter four, when Jesus talks to this Samaritan woman at the well, you answered correct. So I need you to see that we have to spread and put a light and shed a light on this scripture because this is the longest conversation that Jesus had with any person more than Peter, more than John, um, more than John the, the Baptist, anyone, Nicodemus, anyone. This is the longest conversation, dialogue that Jesus had in the scripture. So I think there is some more important things that we need to pull out in this text. Wouldn't you agree? And I want to make sure that we're able to pull this out today. The one thing I, I want to give you a, a couple of things is, is that we have to be careful of making assumptions based on appearance or a few details. We have to be careful of making assumptions uh, based on appearance. And, and that is uh, clear not only in life, but that's also in the scripture. When we're studying scripture, we, we must be careful uh, and completely do our homework and not go judging someone's backstory at a, at a quick glance. Why? Because assumptions affect how we interact with people. Not only do assumptions affect how we interact with people, but assumptions affect how we interact with the scripture. Mm. We're called to dive deeper because as we see this, this story, what we find out that is, is that the second thing is, is that grace is scandalous. Because what happens is, is that sometimes grace breaks all the rules of social norms. Breaks all the rules of social norms. And that means in our encounters, Sometimes the grace in which God has given us and the grace in which we are to extend to somebody else, an unbeliever, will break social norms that society has placed on us. Apparently in this text, uh, 
uh, for Jesus, grace and mercy came before social pressures and religious rules. He didn't care that she was a woman. He didn't care that she was a Samaritan. What Jesus cared about was that this was an opportunity for him to reveal himself to someone who he deemed worthy of revealing himself to. The other thing is this, and, and I said this last week and I want to say it again, that those in transition make the best evangelists. Those in transition make the best evangelists. This woman's life was radically transformed by her encounter with Jesus. Radically transformed because here it was in her own town. She was marginalized. She was she was probably ostracized. But because of that, the town saw something in her. Watch this. The town saw something in her that caused them to believe in her testimony about Jesus. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying to you is, it's the same thing in that man that came out of the tomb when he wanted to go with Jesus. And Jesus told him to go back to the Decapolis and to tell them what God had done for him is that when people see you, they hear your testimony, but most of all, they see your change. Mm, come on, we're getting ready to go now. They see your change in your life. And because of who this woman was, who they thought she was, they thought they knew her. They thought they understood the capacity of what she served in, how she acted, things she did. But now she was acting in a sense where she was moved and they saw the change in her that allowed them to be able to hear what she had to say and believe her testimony. Things that I want us to pull out of this text today is that a relationship with Christ it's always progressive. We got that? A relationship with Christ is always progressive. So you now have to ask yourself this question. Are you growing? Are you growing with Christ? Or is this just, um, you know, another box to check off your list? Are, you, are your roots truly growing deeper in Christ? Or better yet, watch this. Uh, um, if you do feel like you're growing, how are you measuring that? Mm, that's good. How do we measure today, church, spiritual growth? How are we, how are we measuring if, if, if we're becoming who we are called to be? In the book, uh, it's a book called Reveal. Uh, the author talks about four stages and categories that we fall into. And I want you to look at these four stages and find out and see where you fall or where you fit. And we all fit in one of these categories and, and none of them are, uh, are, are, are anything to be uh, sad about or find yourself to be embarrassed about, but it is true. You gotta make up your mind where you fall in. The first group of people is those who are exploring Christ. Those people are uh, those people who are in, in fellowship. They haven't truly made a commitment. They, they are attracted to Christ. You know, they're coming to church. They're singing. Uh, they like the fact of, of the church size. They like the proximity of how far they got to drive to actually get to church. Uh, but they ask questions like, is this really uh, for me? Uh, they also ask like, how much do I have to give up? They take things slow. They... They're slow in, in making decisions in the church. We call this first group, they're exploring Christ and the word we want to use for they are in fellowship. Make sure we're getting this. They're exploring Christ. This is called fellowship. First group, fellowship. And you move, this is, oh, this is so good. When you move, the only way you can move from, from, uh, the first group to the second group is by understanding grace. That salvation comes through grace. And that second group is those who are 
growing in Christ. Make sure we're getting this. Growing in Christ. These people who are growing in Christ, if you're growing in Christ, watch this. You're developing a deeper connection. You're, you're, you're trusting more. Uh, you, you, you're starting to gain expectations now. You know, it's almost, this is almost like a, yeah, it's like a relationship, right? The, the first one was you getting to know him. Now you, you're starting to date Christ, right? Now you, you're at the dating stage. You start opening up more. You know, you, you, you're at this stage now where you're starting to open up, be a little bit more vulnerable. But watch this. It's at this stage that uh, church hurt is very prominent. Very prominent. But this is also the stage where you develop a prayer life. You develop communication. This stage we call relationship. So we go from fellowship to relationship. Everybody walking with me? And you get from fellowship to relationship by grace. I don't want us to miss this. This is so good. That third group is um, the third group is close uh, those who are close to Christ. First group, I'm gonna go back over. Those are the people who are exploring Christ. You're, you're excited. You're excited about coming to church. You're in fellowship. Second group is those who are growing in Christ. You're now developing a deeper connection. Uh, put it like this: you you you're saved, but you're not delivered. <laughs> you know, you'll pray over somebody, but you'll still cuss them out in the heartbeat. <laughs> But now you move to those who are close to Christ. And you move from growing in Christ to being close to Christ. Watch this. By God's word. By gaining a deeper understanding of God's word. Those who are close to Christ. Now watch this. You, you are developing. Uh, you're, you're praying daily. You're reading your Bible. Um, you are leading growth groups. You're worshiping. You're, you're serving. Uh, people are now coming to you for spiritual counsel. And watch this. You're sharing Christ to others. We call this stage discipleship. So we move from fellowship to relationship, now to discipleship. And the last group that um, the author talks about is those who are Christ-centered. So you go from exploring Christ, growing in Christ, being close to Christ, into now being Christ-centered. And the way that you move from being close to Christ to being Christ-centered is, and this was beautiful, is through giving. Wow. Through giving. That means that now you are starting to look like Christ. And that's what, and I always say this, and it reigns true right now, that we are most like Christ when we are giving. We're most like God when we're giving. Why? Make it very simple for you. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. He gave. Jesus gave his life for us. And so now in order to become Christ-centered, we must be in a giving stage. Yes, that's giving of your finances, but it's also giving of your time, giving of your talent and giving of your treasure and even giving yourself. Because those who are Christ-centered, watch this. Everything that they do revolves around Christ. They don't want to do anything that does not give God the glory. This is what Paul was talking about when he said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. These are those people who, who, who find that, that, uh, that they are sold out for Jesus. And this last group is called Lordship. Fellowship, relationship, discipleship, and Lordship. Which group do you fall in? And we're talking about growth, right? Because I want to show you something here in a text that's going to blow your mind. We're talking about growth because this Samaritan woman's growth rested in her being in the presence of Christ. If you truly look at this text, you're going to see, and we're going to open this up. 
we're going to see her growth throughout her being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Everybody ready? Watch this. If you go to verse 9, verse 9, matter of fact, let me take it to you like this. She moved and saw Christ in three different ways. If you look at verse 9, she saw Christ. She said, you are a Jew. I want you to see that in verse 9. As she continued to talk with him and continue to grow and continue to progress, she gets to verse 19 and she said, you are a prophet. She continued to grow, continued to communicate with Christ, continued to be in his presence. We get to verse 29 and she says, could this be the Messiah? <laughs> Did you see it? You see it? Progressively, she starts to grow just being in the presence of God and being able to, to uh, communicate with God. She starts growing. Let's go back to the first part when we talk about you are a Jew. He said, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Here's what I want us to get from this. She identified Jesus as a Jew based on what she saw. She identified Jesus as a Jew based on what she saw. Isn't it just like this? This is us right here. I hope we can see the symbolism here because the world and those who are unbelievers, they, they identify Jesus with how we present him. Mm, mm, mm. How you present Christ is how they see him. How we present Christ now, we may present Christ in a manner that now puts barriers between Christ and between those who are unbelievers. We put legalistic barriers between, or let me say it like this, we put religious barriers between those who are unbelievers and Christ. When we should be the ones that are connecting him. So now when they see the image of Christ that we present, they don't see a connection. My God, they don't see a connection with him. And so now when they see him, all they see themselves as is somebody who is in opposition of Christ. That's why you hear all the time. I got to get myself together before I, you know, I can go to church. I don't want to go to church, man, because my life is not right. Because they don't see themselves as being worthy and seeing themselves as being able to connect, which is why this woman said, you are a Jew, I'm a, I'm a Samaritan. We don't associate with each other. And it's a problem if when we present Christ and we present the image of Christ, that the world sees themselves as not being able to associate with Christ. Not being able to feel connected. So she, what she saw. So that now, now, now the question comes to us is when you present Christ, what, what are people seeing? What do they see in your representation of Christ in your interpersonal evangelism? Because watch this, this interpersonal evangelism, it, it's, it's the time he spent talking to this woman. The time he spent talking to this woman, making sure she understood her significance. Making sure that she felt needed, making sure that she felt known, and making sure that she felt like she belonged. You want to know how to help somebody? You want to know how to, how to bring somebody to Jesus Christ? Make them feel needed. Make them feel known and then make them feel as though they belong. And it didn't matter how long Jesus was to talk to this woman, but he was going to make sure that she felt this. The second thing is, is she got, we get to verse 19 and she said after uh, talking with, with Jesus for some time now, and now she's in dialogue with Jesus. She said, you are a prophet. Verse 19 says, sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. 
So she identified Jesus as a prophet now based on what she understood. The first time she identified Jesus based on what she saw. Now she identified with Jesus based on what she understood. And she had a misunderstanding of who Jesus was. And watch this. This, this whole time, man, this is, this is so good. I hope y'all can get this. This whole time, what Jesus was trying to do was reveal himself to her. That's why it's so important to stay in the presence of God, because staying in the presence of God, he will reveal himself to you. Remember that, uh, that, that, that album Lauren Hill had, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill? I believe today that we have a miseducation of Jesus Christ. Because not knowing what and who he really is becomes a problem for the Christian, becomes a problem for the growth, becomes a problem for your progress. Because if you only know him like, like she knew him, watch this. If you go back into the text, if you go back into the text here, what you see is, is that she understood him as being a supplier of her desires. Here's how we see that. Because she says after uh, he told her about this living water, verse 15, it said, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. And I don't have to keep coming up here to draw water. And so she had a miseducation of who Jesus was. And that's a lot of times where we stand in our Christianity is that we don't truly understand Jesus for who he is. We think that he is there to supply us of our desires and quench our desires. We think that Jesus is here and Jesus is here to make our lives more comfortable, mm. to make life for us easier here. And that's not who he is at all. That's what she thought. That's why she said, give me this kind of water. So I don't have to keep coming back up here all the time. And it's charged. We, we are charged as disciples of Christ to make sure that people understand that Jesus is not some kind, some jack in the box. Where you can be able to pray and, you know, you pray and asking God for a job. Then you get a job that all of a sudden we don't see you no more. He doesn't hear from you anymore. He's more than that. And Jesus understood that she, she had a miseducation of who he was. So right after that, watch what he says. He said, go get your husband and come back. Go get your husband and come back. And then that's when she said, I don't have a husband. He said, I know you don't have a husband. You had five. <clears throat> you had five husbands. And now the one that you're living with, he's not your husband. And so Jesus had to show her this because this was important. And I want to I want to show it to you like this. True understanding comes with an experience. And so now Jesus had to be able to reveal himself and he begins to reveal himself so that now she might have an experience with him. And by the experiences that we gain with him, now we gain a true understanding of who he is. And so now as this experience comes and he starts to reveal himself, she says, whoa, whoa. okay, you're a prophet. Still not truly and fully understanding him, but now she's growing to know him in a different capacity. Oh, man, I hope somebody you got to spend time with Jesus to be able to know him and to grow with him, to know him in the fullness of his capacity. That's why Paul was saying that 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 his uh, uh, he hadn't obtained it because he wanted to make sure that he know him in his resurrection and in the partaking of his suffering to be able to know him, to be able to gain a full understanding of who Christ truly is. 
And now she thinks she's got it. She thinks she, she has it. And she said, oh, you are a prophet. You are a prophet. But I love this about this woman, even though she's, she, she, she's not fully, because she's not act, accurate in her connection, but she's searching for something and she's seeking something and she wants to know more. And Jesus is ready to reveal it to her because she's seeking and the only way that we're going to be able to receive the revelation of God is we're in communication with him. She's asking him and wanting to know more about him. So now Jesus sees that she's seeking and now he moves from seeing her as a Samaritan, seeing her as a woman, to now he sees her as a soul and a life-giving spirit. And now he's ready to impart on her the true knowledge and wisdom of God. But I need you to see this woman because this woman ain't your, she's not your average woman. This woman is smart. This woman is, is intelligent. This woman knew her history. This woman knew her Bible. She was able, watch this, she is having a theological conversation with the Messiah. Oh, y'all don't see it. Y'all don't see it. Y'all don't see it. If you saw it right now, you'd be clapping your hands. If you saw it right now, you'd be saying amen. This woman is having a theological conversation with Jesus Christ. On a mountain at Jacob's well. Watch it. This, ooh, man. Look at what she says, verse 20. She said, hold on, Jesus. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Are y'all hearing what she's saying? She, she, she's letting Jesus know that, that here's what I understand about this whole church thing. Here's what I understand about this whole Christian thing is you guys, Jews, feel like the only way that we can be able to have this holiness and have this righteousness is if we worshiped in Jerusalem. And we believe that we must worship on this mountain. And it's the same thing today. We as Christians, we're presenting things and making people believe that the only way that they can truly be able to receive God and the only way they can truly be able to receive Christ is if they get it in this way. If they come to church. If we stay in tradition. That's what she's saying. She said, and, 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 and this is a problem. And then Jesus in, in, in conversation comes back with her and says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, watch this. A time is coming. Having a theological conversation. This woman did, she didn't have a, a, a divinity degree. She didn't have a theology degree. She didn't have a religion degree, a philosophy degree. But she understood, uh, um, um, she understood that she was growing. You could see the growth in her. To be able to have this conversation. And Jesus said this. Watch this. He said, <clears throat> believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Y'all getting this? You getting this? He's tearing down the barriers. He's tearing down religion. He's tearing down traditionalism. I know y'all worshiped on this mountain. And I know that the friction has been that we've been saying you got to worship in the church and you got to worship in Jerusalem. But now I'm tearing it all down because here's what I'm truly seeking. This is what the world needs to hear. This is what people need to hear. We want to bring them into the church. They need to hear this, that it's not about that. It's not about seeking God for tradition and seeking God to be able to get a checklist or to have this religious resume. But he's saying this. Watch what he says. It's not about worshiping neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. This means salvation is coming through the Jews because salvation is coming through me. Are y'all with me? I'm in verse 22. Stay with me. Stay with me now. Then watch what he says in 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And y'all missing this thing. The, the time is now where we're breaking down the walls. The pandemic broke down the walls. We're moving all of the, the, the barriers out of the way. 
We're being able now to connect with those who are lost, connect with those who have said we couldn't reach, connect with those who've been ridiculed, connect with those who are being ostracized. And now it is the time for the true worshipers. And Jesus is seeing in this woman that she is a true worshiper because he's revealing to her the mysteries of God and, and imparting on her what he is, uh, 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 what, what God's true uh, purpose is for sharing the gospel. And watch what he says. Yet yeah, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth outside the church and inside the church. Rebuking all the fallacies, rebuking all the things that the world has to say. We gon' we got we gotta stand on the truth. How do we become disciples? How do we stand against this world? How do we be able to to uh, uh, still be able to to maintain our integrity in this world? Is we have to stand on the truth. And then he says, "For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks." <laughs> Yes, Lord, they the kind of worship that the Father seeks. He's looking for the real church. Are y'all getting this? And he wants us to share this with the world. Baby, God is looking for the true worshipers, the one who's ready to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so he says, watch this. He said, God is spirit. That means you have to find a way to connect with him. And you have the only way that you're able to connect with him if you're going to worship Huh? Huh? If you're going to worship, y'all, the only way, it's not an option. He said, you must worship me in spirit and in truth. And then watch this. The woman said, I know the Messiah. Oh, hold on. Now, now you, you start to see the growth now. She's, uh, she's staying in conversation, staying in communication, staying in his presence, staying in conversation, staying in communication, staying in his presence. And then she says, boom, I know the Messiah called the Christ is coming. Oh man, it's getting good. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one you're speaking to, I am he. If we stay in his presence long enough, he'll reveal himself to you. What I'm saying to us today is, church, is that being a true disciple and, and wanting to grow and wanting to move and progress in the stages of discipleship, you got to stay in his presence. This woman stayed long enough in his presence to gain an encounter with Jesus Christ. And then she said this, verse 29. Come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Wait a minute. When she first saw him, she said, you're a Jew. When she started to understand more, she said, you're a prophet. And now that it has been revealed to her, she said, could this be the Messiah? That's how we progress in Christianity. No, we're not going to all just jump at the end. We don't start at the end, but we grow. It's a growth process. We got to let people know, hey, it's all right to be a, a, a growing in Christ. It's all right to explore Christ. Stop looking down on people because they're not where you are. It's okay. Because watch this, the primary, and, 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 and I like this because uh, um, Jesus told, told this woman about her past, but watch this, uh, her, the primary purpose of Jesus revealing her past was not to accuse her of her sin, but to give her conviction for her testimony. The primary purpose was not to uh, uh, convict her or condemn her of her sins, but to give her conviction for her testimony. So now that when she went back to her town, the conviction, the passion, the excitement that she had, people would see the change. Ah, that is right there. They would see the change in her life and then they would want to know about the change. It's the, it's the conviction of a testimony. And watch this. Testimony without conviction is only a story. 
Mm, I hope you're getting that. Testimony without conviction is only a story. Because watch this. She was convicted. She told her testimony. And when she told her testimony, it says the people came out of the town. And they came toward him. <laughs> they came toward him. What am I saying? Ooh, watch this. When you tell your testimony, it's not going to draw people to you. When you tell your testimony, they're going to come to see Jesus. Yes, Lord. They're going to come to see Christ. When you tell your testimony, somebody is going to come to Christ. And I love this, this how she went back. She dropped her water pot and went back. The man that came out the tomb went back. It's something about telling your testimony that's calling you to go back to where you came from. Because you have to show them the change and what God has done in your life. I want you to think about this. How many people need to hear your testimony? How many people need to know that there's a change? Don't be afraid. God is saying, stop being scared to talk about me. Stop being scared to share about me. Because if, you be, if, if you're afraid to share me, and you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you before my Father, which is in heaven. So why are you scared right now? Haven't I done enough? That you ought to feel excited to share your testimony? Sharing, uh, 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 sharing Christ should be simple. Share your excitement. Share your passion about what Christ has done in your life. And watch people come running to Christ. We thank God for his word today. Um, and I can do three more series on this uh, because it's just so good and it's just so rich. But I want us to see this. I want us to see this interpersonal evangelism. We got to spend time with these people. We got to make sure they're needed, make sure they're known, make sure they belong. We can't make assumptions. Make them understand that grace is going to break down barriers. Show them themselves in the, the text. This woman grew in her personal relationship with Jesus Christ just by being in his presence. She learned more about him. And sometimes it's going to be confusing. You might not fully understand exactly who he is at times. But if you stay there long enough, baby, you're going to get to know him. And knowing him is what we all should desire. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today. If you're here today um, and you have not made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, we, we ask today that you uh, type your name in the chat. We got a text app, 832-402-8596. Text yes to that number. To get your life right with Christ. If you don't know that you're going to heaven, if you don't know without a shadow of a doubt that today, you died today that you're going to heaven. We need to make this right today. We can't let this hour pass. So I want to pray for you tonight. If God is speaking to you tonight, I want to pray for you, Lord. We, we pray for those who are hearing and under the sound of my voice, God, who have been challenged by this word. Maybe, God, they fall in one of those four categories, exploring Christ, growing in Christ, close to Christ. And maybe they're at the point, God, with the Christ in it. But the one thing that we do know, God, is we need you. We need to know you in the pardon of our sins. And God, that person who's lost today, God, we pray, God, that they believe in their hearts and confessing with, with their mouth that you live, you die, God, and you rose again from the grave. You have all authority today. If they believe that in their heart today, God, they're saved. And so, God, we rejoice with them today. In Jesus' name, we pray and say amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer with us today, we declare that you are saved by the word of God, which says that you are saved in Romans 10 and 9. Now we ask that we go in peace. We love you. May God bless you and keep you is our prayer. Amen.